Everybody, Ambassador Larry Huggins here in Barcelona, Spain. Welcome back to Your Good Life. Have a great episode for you today in our continuing series that is taken from my manuscript, the Codex Rex, the Book of the King. This is part two. Part one had 17 uh, episodes. And part two, well, we'll see. We're in episode number two now. And this is, uh, I'm calling this Jesus was always the king. In the first part, we talked about the fact that Jesus lived as a king. He had a he had a palatial place to live. In fact, it was a palace. People have a hard time accepting that, but it's a biblical fact and uh, many, many proofs. You're going to get a lot out of this. It'll change the way you see Jesus, his lifestyle, how he was perceived. You'll see him different and you'll begin to live differently. I believe it. Father, thank you for everyone who's watching, listening receiving and achieving what you have for us, which is nothing less than the good life. <clears throat> Amen. I probably should have brought some water, but I didn't. All right. Jesus was always king, part two. And uh, we have a lot of messianic prophecies. In fact, I'll say this. It's To me, I find it uh, compelling and fascinating that there were over 435 messianic prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. If you take only 48 of those prophecies and, and com compute the mathematical probabilities, it's 1 in 10 to the 157th power. What is that? It's 10 with 157 zeros after it. <laughs> it is an astronomically large number. So it was, uh, it's, it's literally scientific proof that Jesus was the Messiah. Praise the Lord. And uh, we believe that. There are many messianic prophecies. I want to give you one here, Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days shall come, says the Lord, that I will raise unto David a branch, and he shall be king and prosper. <laughs> Praise God, he shall prosper. Uh, I don't know where people get the poverty from because it's all through the scriptures that he was wealthy. Remember, wise men brought him gifts, and you will be Staggered to know how much wealth they gave him. It's an amazing amount of wealth. So uh, Jesus was the king. He was the prophesied king. And uh, it was common knowledge that he was king. It wasn't common knowledge that he was the savior. <laughs> A few people knew it. But everyone else in, in Israel and surrounding areas saw him as the king. Uh, Mary knew he was the king. Luke 1.31. The angel said to Mary, behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and he sh you shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and he shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There shall be no end. Mary knew he was a king. Well, she was a royal and so was Joseph. And uh, I'm not going to get into all the, uh, the genealogies today, but uh, uh, there are a lot of proofs that Jesus was and indeed is the king. Um, let, me, uh, let me close my iPad here and, and start working from my computer screen. I have some very important things I want to share with you here. And so uh, Mary knew he was king. Who else knew he was king? Well, the Magi knew that he was the king. Now, the Magi came from other countries, and it wasn't just three. Um, Eastern tradition says there were 12 Magi. We know that there were more than three because uh, the Bible names where they come from. They came from uh, Sheba and Seba, Seba and Ethiopia and Tarshish in Egypt and all the nations of the east, east all the nations of the east. So uh, the Magi converged on Israel from all over, and they didn't travel alone. They traveled in uh, something called a Kegel, which is a big caravan, but it's more than a caravan because 
It's really a movable palace. It has soldiers, it has servants, it has livestock, it has provisions, it has uh, administrators. It's the same way that the Queen of Sheba came from uh, Sheba to, to honor Solomon. And this is what kingdoms did in those days. They made alliances. They aligned themselves with other kings by giving them covenant gifts, tribute, if they will. And so uh, Sheba gave great gifts unto Solomon. Lots of wealth was, was taken from Sheba and put in the hands of King Solomon. Well, the same thing happened to Jesus, only instead of one sovereign, Sheba, it was from at least 12 different nations. So this was a large group. It was like it, there were armies, really, if you'll accept it. And uh, they came in, to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, it was a surprise visit. Surprise. Here are thousands of people out here. And uh, uh, the head guys, the Magi, came and talked to Herod, and they said, well, we've come to... Uh, uh, we've come to uh, find the king. Well, let me read it. Matthew 2, 1. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem saying, where is that who is born the king of the Jews? Praise God. We've come to worship him. We have come to pay our respects for him. We've come to give him obeisance. Uh, uh, that word there, worship, means to kneel and prostrate and to do homage or to make obeisance in order to express respect and to make supplication. It's used of homage shown to men of higher rank. Okay, so these, uh, these magi, which rep were representatives or ambassadors of the kingdoms that sent them, came and, and submitted themselves to Jesus, who was uh, two years old, and they gave him gifts, staggering amounts of gifts. And uh, so, so all of Jerusalem at this point knew that the king had been born, the king, that Jesus was the king, uh, Matthew 2, 3. When Herod, the king, heard these things, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Why were they troubled? because of three wise men or 12 wise men? No, they were troubled because they got the news that the king of the Jews had been born. This is going to change everything. This is going to be uh, very upsetting and change the status quo. Not only Herod was uh, threatened by this, but all of Jerusalem, because they sensed that something dramatic, something historic had happened. Their, their promised Messiah, their anointed king, deliverer, had been born. Uh, so it was troubling. Uh, it, it made them very distraught. And remember that a, a lot of people uh, um, enjoyed being under Roman occupation because they had all kinds of, of concessions and, uh, you know, uh, opportunities that they didn't have before. Uh, under the Roman rule, they had all kinds of opportunities. Okay, Herod and all of Jerusalem knew that Jesus was the king, and all of the chief priests and scribes knew that he was the king. Matthew 2, 4, when Herod had gathered all the chief priests and scribes, how many? All of them. I don't know how many chief priests there were, but he gathered all of them and all of the scribes uh, and uh, of the people together, and he demanded where Christ should be born. And they, in agreement, said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it's written by the prophet, and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people. Messianic prophecy. Praise the Lord. So all of the chief priests knew he was king. All of the people knew he was the king. Herod knew he was the king. These uh, wise men and all their servants and soldiers knew he was king. The countries that sent them, the wise men, uh, knew that he was king. They had been expecting the king to be born, and all the prophecies that they were very familiar with pointed to Bethlehem of Judea, and that, uh, that fact was agreed upon by all of the chief priests and all of the scribes without a doubt. 
all of that part of the world knew that the king of the Jews had been born and they knew who he was. His name was Jesus. Praise God. Um, I know it's not what you were taught in Sunday school, but it's the Bible. And uh, I'm going to skip over a lot of things. Usually I, I laugh and say even blind Bartimaeus knew that Jesus was king because he said, oh, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He called him by his title, son of David, which was the title that King Jesus had. And that title was, uh, was referenced 12 times in the New Testament. So, uh, yes, people knew that he was, he was the king. Remember, they gave him a, a triumphant entry in Jerusalem where, where all the people came out in the streets and sang, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And they presumed that he was, Jesus was going to Jerusalem to be coronated king because they knew he was the king and they were ready to have him coronated. In fact, at one point, they were going to coronate him by force and uh, Jesus hid himself. It wasn't his time. And you, you know how this story played out, right? Well, I've come, I've come to the end of my time here, but let me say this about uh, Pontius Pilate, who was the second most important person in the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was the greatest empire in the world at that time. So uh, among secular nations, Pontius Pilate was the second most powerful person in the world. He had lots of influence. Uh, he was put there by Augustus himself. And anything that happened in, in Palestine, that word went back to Rome. So this thing was, was not done secretly. In fact, uh, you know, the Romans ruled Egypt where Jesus had spent time in exile and they, they ruled uh, the whole Mediterranean area there, it was huge. And so this idea of the King of the Jews wasn't just localized information, uh, it was spread abroad without doubt, without doubt. I mean, everything being equal, people are the same today as they were then. And, and we lived to learn something new, what the news is, it was big news. It was big news. Uh, when Herod slew all the children, two years and younger, it was big news when the wise men came and inquired of Jesus. It was big news when all the high priests and scribes said, yep, he's going to come out of, come out of Bethlehem. Uh, it was big news when he rode into Jerusalem. And it was big news when he was crucified. And I'll say this, I'll get into this in another episode uh, actually, the way they crucified him was something that they only did for kings. Yeah, a lot of people were crucified and tortured through crucifixion, executed by crucifixion. But there were special circumstances to the way Jesus was crucified. And uh, that kind of treatment was reserved for Kings, the Roman armies uh, had a way of dealing with the kings of the nations they had conquered, uh, a way of humiliating them. And so uh, uh, Pilate asked Jesus, he said, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, yes, you said it. <laughs> he said, you said it. And uh, so Pilate had already heard. In fact, he said, shall I release into you a Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Christ? Uh, the, the anointed king, and they said Barabbas. And, uh, and so here's what, here's what Pilate did. He wrote a sign and he put it on top of the cross where Jesus was, Luke 23, 38, and a superscription, that means a sign that's above, was also written over him in letters of Greek and of Latin, and of Hebrews, this is the king of the Jews. Now, the leaders of the Sanhedrin who had perjured Jesus and had him murdered through proxy told Pilate, uh, uh, don't say that. Say he claimed he was the king. And Pilate said, what I've said, I've said. What I've written, I've written. In other words, it's the facts, and we're going to leave it as the facts. Uh, these people knew he was the king. They just didn't want him to be their king. <laughs> and uh, it was gonna it was gonna upset the apple cart. It was gonna change the status quo. And so they lied against him and uh, suborned him. And what they actually did was they assassinated their king, had him assassinated, which is uh, 
uh, I don't even know the word for that. Is it uh, regicide or something like that? I, I don't know, but they actually had a coup and murdered the hereditary king of Israel, everyone's champion. And uh, today we see uh, the crucifixion as our victory, but uh, the Jews saw it as defeat. They had lost their king. It was a terrible thing. So uh, why write the sign, the king of the Jews, in Greek? Well, because that was the language of commerce. And everyone in the Roman Empire, just about everyone in government, in commerce, did, took care of their business in Greek. And because the Romans ruled the empire, uh, the Latin language was spread throughout that part of the world. And then Hebrew was, uh, was the, the language of the Old Testament. It was the language of the Jews. So uh, it was, it was uh, in uh, Latin and Hebrew and Greek, this is the king of the Jews. I presume it was Aramaic and Greek. Uh, I'll, I'll have to research that for you. If you know, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll put it in the manuscript. And by the way, uh, anything you want to suggest or correct or have questions about, uh, send it to me, Pastor Larry at zchurch.life or leave it in the comments. And I'll examine that. And there's a very good chance that your, your help and your comments will get into uh, the book when it's published. This is the King of the Jews. This is the King of the Jews. Um, this, this crucifixion was a big deal. A lot of people witnessed it. A lot of people watch it. Those who didn't witness it, doubtless heard about it. And what did they hear? That Pilate believed that Jesus was the king. Well, that's what the multitudes believed too. So it's not surprising that Jesus wore a king, kingly clothes. He did. He wore a royal red, which we'd call purple, um, robes. Uh, garments dyed in the blood of grapes, the Bible says. Uh, a garment knit in one piece. He, 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 was, uh, he dressed accordingly. He didn't dress in carpenter's clothes. I don't get Hollywood's wrong about that. And he lived in a palace. He didn't live in a hovel. He was not homeless. He lived in a palace, an ivory palace with the music of stringed instruments. <laughs> he wore perfume. He smelled of clothes and aloes. He was a royal. He banqueted. He fed multitudes of people who sat at meat in his house. And they did that on an ancillary basis, not just once and again. And he had an entourage, he had an organization. Uh, he was the king and he behaved in every way that a, a regent should be behave or a king should behave. Uh, of course, prior to being coronated, but in his ceremonial duties, he, he behaved that way. And from a practical point of view too, he had a headquarters. He had an organization that was comprised of, of uh, three who were very close to him, 12 in the inner circle, another 70 in the, in the middle circle and multitudes in the outer circle, over 500 and then the multitudes. So he had it set up a, in, a, in a kind of a multi-level uh, hierarchy there. And uh, he, he covered all of Israel and outlying areas as well. He sent his 70 out to every town and village that he would later come to. Praise the Lord. You see how he was, how he was uh, managing his kingdom. He was visiting every city and every village in Israel. Plus, he went over into Samaria, right? Praise the Lord. Ah, man, this, I find this so exciting because it, it paints Jesus not as a poor carpenter, but as a wealthy royal. And you and I are kings and priests unto our God. And we need to recognize that our, our, our brother, our elder brother is, is royal. And we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We rule and reign in life by one Christ Jesus, the king, not by the carpenter, by the king. <laughs> oh, well, uh, I hope you're as excited as I am. I went over a couple of minutes, but I can't help it when I get excited. I've got a great episode for you tomorrow. Please be back with me. Go back and check out the other stuff on our, 
uh, Z Church channel on YouTube or go to our website, zchurch.life, zchurch.life. And uh, we have all these uh, episodes uh, archived there. Uh, we, we keep pretty much up to date. We may be a couple of episodes behind, but we, uh, we always catch up. We have a, a great team and, and uh, they get us caught up uh, right away. And uh, the other thing I want to say to you is uh, uh, we do appreciate your tithes and offerings and uh, encourage you to give. I've put something up on the screen there. If you, uh, if you go to your good life, zchurch.life forward slash give, you can uh, leave us an offering. So into your good life. I am committed to spending the, um, by God's grace, the years that I have remaining, um, putting um, the, the things that I've learned in my 48 years of ministry into books and, and other forms of uh, publications that will benefit posterity. And I've got several books in the works. The one that I'm working on now is called Codex Rex, the Book of the King. And the information I've been sharing in these episodes, uh, recent episodes, are part of that book. They're going into the book that'll be published before the year's out. So help me get these books out. Uh, I've got another book in the works called The Gospel of Paul. And I have another book that I'm working on a manuscript that's called The, uh, the uh, In Him New Testament. It's really an annotated New Testament Bible, uh, but it's, <laughs> it's a very big work. Uh, right now it's over 400 pages. And on top of that, I'm uh, pastoring Z Church, and on top of that, um, we have a, a lot of other irons in the fire that we take care of. So uh, it's a it's good ground. It'd be a good investment for you, and actually, you're sowing into your good life. So thank you for your gift, and visit us at Z Church uh, every Saturday morning, 10 o'clock a.m. Pacific time. And I'll say adios de Barcelona. Sometimes. The most beautiful things can be